Hello, beautiful community, I presume. You're there, I'm here, so we can go on and have a little chat about the broader political and ethical interestingness about this business of the United States sending cluster munitions to Ukraine. And I did this typically in the form of a, a Twitter thread for us because it just condenses what I want to say. But let me just say a couple of words to begin with. This business of can we give Ukraine a toothbrush? Can we give Ukraine a baby baseball bat? Can we give Ukraine a full baseball bat? How quickly can we give them a baseball bat? Can we give them 17 baseball bats? What if we give them a really big stick? Has somebody else given them a big stick? Hmm. Does that mean we now can give them a big stick? And has giving them a big stick provoked Mr. Putin or not? So this sort of somewhat understandable, but also somewhat, somewhat comic story is a product of two things. First of all, nuclear escalation management, which is completely understandable. But it's also, frankly, a product of a superpower projecting itself on the international scene in a way that on this particular occasion we can say is constructive and benign, United States supporting Ukraine, but without a clarity of proactive strategy. Right? And that is one of the sort of brick walls we just crash into so often when we talk about the international scene and try to engage in some normative reflection about it that we are often dealing with platitudes beyond which we haven't reflected much. Now, we often talk about platitudes in our conversations. Um, there are plenty of platitudes about on the pro-Ukrainian side. Um, there is, for instance, the platitude among the Russian opposition about how they want to live in a normal country. I mean, there is a platitude in much of the Ukrainian I internet scene um, which is about joining the civilized world um, and also about decolonizing and derussifying without a constructive picture of exactly what that means for Ukraine. But there's also a really, 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 really big platitude that we will be talking about a lot more, and that is preserving the rules-based international order. Now, if you think that there is such a thing as that and that all we need to do is preserve it, I mean, your analysis of the international scene, of the um, disorderly nature of it, of the sustained period of incoherence of the international scene that we are entering into, your picture of that is a little bit in the realm of comedy, if you think that what we need to do is restore um, the, or, or refurbish the already present international, the, the rules-based international order. Now. A very important question arises, and if I weren't sick, I probably would have a piece about this in the Atlantic, but there is time. And that is, how can Western powers reimagine the international order while their democracies are in decline? That hasn't actually been formulated properly as a question. We need to do it, we need to talk about it, and we shall. So, of course, the point of this conversation about cluster munitions is not to discuss cluster munitions, but to discuss the um, ethical and political interestingness of that move. And I am going to put as priority number seven the fact that I rather follow the logic of the U.S. administration on this. But I'm not here to tell you whether you know this is a, a great a great move or whether it, there's something wrong with it. This is not my job, even though I rather follow the logic of the U.S. administration here. And I'm generally of the opinion, of course, that you know about that we're, we've systemically underarmed Ukraine, and it may be that we're looking at some of the consequences of that. In my capacity as a moral philosopher, um, I want to say about something about these, this cluster munitions story. The question, I say, isn't whether it's morally unambiguous or just, 
for the US to send cluster munitions to Ukraine. The question is whether it is militarily necessary and whether that necessity outweighs all other political considerations. First, let's look at what the question is not. The question is not whether Ukraine should use cluster munitions. It is whether the USA should give Ukraine cluster munitions. Ukraine has, up to a certain extent, already been using cluster munitions. And of course, the Russians have been using them in um, outrageous abundance. The question is not whether Ukraine would get an immediate military benefit from US cluster munitions. The consensus seems to me that it seems to be that it would, and I'm not in a position to comment on that further. The question is not whether there are strong reasons for the USA not to give Ukraine cluster munitions. Any reasonable arguer must agree that there are. We'll come back to that because this is really something that goes to the core of how we talk about things. That we, we really struggle with this idea that reasons don't go away just because they're outweighed, right? I mean, let's be just a little bit banal here. You know, you might have a reason to take your kid to basketball, but you also have a some kind of a group meeting, monthly group meeting that day for mums or for dads to talk about their marriage or something like that and the two events clash what are you going to do well you're taking your kid to the basketball but you're missing the group the group gathering you know the pull to be at the group gathering doesn't evaporate just because you override it you still have very good reason to be there it's just on this occasion you have weighed it in favor of basketball for the kid but that that doesn't mean your reasons to be with the group have disappeared. They've just been outweighed. So outweighed doesn't mean disappeared. The question is, does a broad picture of U.S. national interest, broad, which includes all the disputes about what might be construed as national interest and introduces also clearly an ethical dimension into a U.S. national interest picture, but does a broad picture of the U.S. national interest allow the military advantage Ukraine will derive from getting cluster munitions to outweigh other considerations, including alienating allies who may, may be in a fragile consensus, if, if any at all, about whether this is good, routinizing the use of a weapon we may want to ban, And here there are stories, you know, you don't just want to win the war, you want to win the war in the right way, and that in the medium to long term, winning the war in the right way matters. Damaging the moral case for backing Ukraine, and that's, I think, particularly important at the level of citizens in Western countries, right? We don't want to do things that are going to fragment further um, the capacity for political forces in Western countries that want to keep on supporting Ukraine or want to even escalate support to Ukraine. You don't want to put them in a position where they are beginning to sort of scrape the, scrape the bottom of the pool without there being much water left there. You want that organic citizen support sustained. So, you know, does Ukraine's military advantage outweigh all of that from a U.S. national security perspective? There is also the question of endangering future Ukrainian civilians, and that might not be a, a very big question in the scheme of things because we're talking about you know, endangering Ukrainian civilians now via not doing enough to stop Putin's outrageous imperialistic invasion. And here the answer, I'll still stick on this for a bit, stuff exploding um, in years to come in Ukraine. Here the answer, that's up to Ukraine to decide, actually doesn't quite settle this. It's certainly up to Ukraine to demand these weapons. And quite frankly, Ukraine, um, anybody clinically sane in Ukraine's position would just demand every damn thing they can get that works and demand it hard and fast. But 
you know, it's up to Ukraine to demand these weapons, and of course anybody in Ukraine's place would, but it's up to the USA to give them. So let's clarify this a bit more. It's not a good idea, this is a really important sort of independent point, it's not a good idea to cry imperialism each time someone points out that Ukraine's and the USA's national interests do not overlap completely. And often whether they do and to what extent they do is a matter of exploration rather than declaration. My own position is that a proper interpretation of US national interests um, brings it out that the problem is more at the level of a clear strategy around what we take to be the US national interest um, rather than problems about you know how far the US national interest overlaps with Ukraine's it overlaps sufficiently with Ukraine's anyway um, so it's not a good idea to cry imperialism each time someone points out that Ukraine's and USA's national interests don't overlap completely. It is only a combo of Ukrainian courage and Ukrainian fight and Ukrainian civic mobilization and Ukrainian all of these things that Ukraine has done so extraordinarily well. So the combination of that and in this particular case a benign projection of US imperial power that's kept Putin's brutal imperial, now in the negative sense, invasion at bay. Let's briefly turn to ethics, and here we're going to drift a bit more away from concreteness, but we're going to go right to the heart of how such decisions are made by politicians. It's very important for what we talk about all the time. Um, one way to judge a political decision is procedurally, by looking at how it was made. Looking at Biden's decision to send cluster munitions to Ukraine sideways, we can draw a lesson about the place of ethics in political decision-making. We don't want politicians, and the place of ethics in, in political decision-making is really that it has its place, but it can't have a place that takes up all of the space there. So ethics is one consideration among others in politics. Politics is absolutely not applied ethics. If you want to do applied ethics and you want to just make decisions according to moral instinct or various moral principles or dispositions or whatever, the, the, you, could never, you could just about be a local councillor maybe. But as soon as you get to a medium level of political power, morality has to get out of the way much of the time. But you don't want a situation where it completely drops out to the wind and then we get catastrophe. No. We don't want politicians who are too quick to override ethical considerations. But we also don't want politicians who are immobilized by situations in which ethical considerations need to be put aside in favor of necessity. Obama's alleged remark about himself, which sounds plausible whether it's true or not that he made it. We have a president who is good at killing, is about exactly this. Obama, if he did indeed say this, didn't mean I'm casual about killing. He meant I can kill without losing my moral compass. And on the one hand, and on the other hand, without being paralyzed by the consequences. So to be a leader of a major power, you need to be able to engage in destructive decision-making, decision-making that has very destructive consequences for human life in, around the globe, but also in your country. You want to minimize that, of course, um, but you've got to be able to do that while um, combining your dirty hands with a moral compass that has not sort of become emaciated in virtue of you having dirty hands. Right? So you've got to retain the moral compass while having dirty hands, that's one bit. And the other bit, you've got to not be too destabilized by this. You can't be completely oblivious to it, right? That's dangerous too. But you can't be a president who has made destructive decisions 
and then can't sleep at night, right? That's why most humans could not be in Barack Obama's position, actually. Most humans would not be comfortable to engage in the level of destructive activity that a president of the United States inevitably has to engage in. Um, now, often you are in a position where there'll be even more destruction, potentially, if you don't make a certain decision, but there we go. Now, a key takeaway here is that in politics, ethics is one consideration among others, and it's a disaster when politics loses all sight of ethics, but if all you've got is ethics, then there can be no politics. High-powered politics requires decisions which carry disastrous human consequences. Another key takeaway is that reasons don't go away just because they're outweighed. In politics, a decision that is on balance reasonable will often contain significant moral wrong, or in our ban banal case, and um, imperfectly ethical case, um, some wrong is con contained in you skipping this thing your group meeting and taking your baby to basketball. Um, and even in terms of your responsibility to your baby as a parent, the basketball playing baby, you should go to these meetings because they sustain you as a parent and so on. So, but but that's, that, that's that loss, that's that residue of loss doesn't go away from, from you know, that, that decision, that the loss is constitutive. Finally, Biden's process feels adequate. In other words, I mean that um, ethically and politically, the way Biden arrived at the decision feels adequate, which doesn't prove the decision is right. But the reason it feels adequate primarily is because he absolutely felt the pressure of all the considerations against the decision that he made. Right? And whatever you think of Joe Biden, I think on this occasion this was very clear indeed. So I'm saying he prioritized US national interest in giving Ukraine a weapon she badly needs and harmed, and here what I'm going to say is just a placeholder. You could put anything else, or you could put something better than what I've put in this place. So he uh, prioritized the US national interest in giving Ukraine a weapon she badly needs, and harmed the political momentum toward a global prohibition of cluster munitions, right? Which means that it may well be absolutely right for um, charity organizations, for organizations like Human Rights Watch to say, hey, mate, what on earth are you doing? Stop that now, right? That has to be the position organizations like that take. But at the same time, what Biden is saying here is, well, we're scrambling to handle this thing. We've got some things we want to avoid. We want to avoid any risk of Ukraine losing its independence. But we also want to put Ukraine in the strongest possible position. What are our realistic options now? I don't love this at all, but I'm going to do it. I think that's what we've got to do. Um, and so there is cognizance of the weight of everything that goes against his decision. Um, that's why whatever you think of that decision, I do believe it is procedurally adequate and shows a responsible politicking, right? Um, but of course that does not mean that various organizations don't shout. It's their job to shout because they want to say, can we move one inch closer to a world without, you know, cluster munitions? Um, so that's how I'd weigh it. A few uh, people, of course, expect to come to my, I don't know what the hell this is. Um, what is this? Some kind of cafe I'm offering here, right? But they wanted just fish and chips. And the fish and chips would be, give it now! Shut up about all other considerations! So a few people wanted that from my tweet, but that is widely available. You don't need me to, to, to say that, right? And um, that's why that wasn't what this video was about. Um, been away for a day or two, I think, from speaking with you for health reasons, but I hope to be more connected going forward. Um, lots and lots of love and talk very soon.